Okay, now, I was telling you earlier about the book, give me just a second. Sorry, just in case James comes in. All right. So I was telling you about why they, uh, you know, they uh, for the for the Shavuot, they um, read the Book of Ruth. So this is what I found on why they read Ruth. Why, how it's significant with Jesus and the whole thing. So it's going to be dry, and I apologize ahead of time. I'll sing and do a dance for you if you want. You know, like like David did. You know, uh, what's that song? When the Spirit of the Lord came upon his, his came, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David danced. Right? Anyway, <clears throat> sorry. I just did another video, it was like 20 minutes long, so my voice is about shot. But it says, In the beginning, God was king in his garden. There was more than plenty, but Eve thought she was empty. So she turned. Now, I got this from the Spoken Gospel channel on YouTube so this is what I got from there I literally wrote it down as they said it so um, I will put their link in the in the video comment so you could go and see the video that goes with it but this is what they said in the beginning God was king in his garden there was more than plenty but Eve thought she was empty so she turned away from her king and found herself a barren kingdom God promised one of Eve's offspring would be his new king one of Eve's sons would buy back his kingdom. One of Eve's sons would redeem them. Children were threatened by infertility. Her emptiness passed down God's family tree. Sarah's empty womb could bear no king. Rebecca's barrenness could bring no royalty. Rachel's infertility could not fill a throne. Eve's daughters could, would not bear their emptiness alone. God gave each husband each a husband with whom they could reproduce. This is not true of widowed Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Like Eve, Naomi left God's land for a barren kingdom, and she is now a widow and has no king or royal heir to redeem them. Yet because of God's promise to Eve, one of Ruth's offspring would be his new king. One of Ruth's sons would buy back the kingdom her son would redeem them for the barrenness of Eve's tree that had to be filled, and so did Naomi's. The cost and price is high, and Ruth takes on Naomi's emptiness and responsibilities for her family tree to secure God's provision, and the process would find a king on a farm. Ruth starts to glean. The landowner is Boaz, who takes responsibility to provide and fill for them more than plenty. God would provide, but not on the food Boaz provides, but through his family line. Ruth comes to find out this man that went out of his way to feed them was in Naomi's family tree. He could be her redeemer. Naomi knows this means Boaz can buy back her estate says he is related to her. He can keep the deed in her family's name and maybe feel her barrenness too. But Naomi is far too old. The redemption would have to come through Ruth if he takes her as a wife. Their child will save Naomi's line. So one night after Boaz brought in the harvest, Ruth seeks to fill Naomi's emptiness as she had promised. She brings her need to the one who can redeem to the one who can buy back Naomi's land and continue her family tree. Ruth proposes to Boaz, asking him to spread his wings, or garment, robe, blanket, whatever, and take her in, and with Naomi's burden, carry her. And generously, Boaz agrees to marry her, and again, Boaz takes full responsibility for Ruth and Naomi. But this time, he would not just bring them wheat, but bring life to their family tree. And to show just how costly this responsibility will be, another redeemer refuses to meet Naomi's needs. He had first right to preserve her line and territory. So Boaz brings their need to him at the city gates. He tells them Naomi and Ruth are his to save if he is willing to pay the price for their redemption that would have to be paid. 
but the cost is too high for him, the burden too great. So like a rich king, Boaz gladly takes the price of redemption on himself. He will be the one God will, would use to fill and to save. Boaz marries Ruth. Their union provides a redeemer and redemption for Naomi. Ruth is no longer empty, for she has turned to her rich groom. Boaz will give her a child. He will fill Ruth's womb. But Ruth passes down her fullness to Naomi's family tree in emptiness. She would give up her only son to fill Naomi's barrenness. This is how God fulfilled the promise he made to Eve. For one of Naomi's offspring would be God's new king. Sorry. One of, one of Naomi's sons would buy back the kingdom. One of Naomi's sons would redeem them. This is how God had always has always acted. For Sarah's empty womb would bear a king. Rebecca's barrenness would bring royalty. Rachel's infertility would fill a throne. For God never leaves any of Eve's daughters empty or alone. And this story is completed in Mary. She's another woman, a virgin with another empty womb. But this time there is no husband and there is no one like Ruth. So God himself would be Mary's rich groom. As God promised, Mary's offspring is his new king. Mary's son will buy back his kingdom. Mary's son would redeem everyone. And this son is Jesus, the son of Eve, the son of Ruth, the son of Naomi, the son of Mary. Jesus is God's rich king who, like Ruth, takes responsibility for our emptiness and, like Boaz, gives us fullness at a great cost to himself. Jesus, God's only son, fills all our bareness. Now we can come to Jesus like Ruth came to Boaz. We can bring our need to the one who can buy us back. So bring Jesus your emptiness, your need, your infertility, like Ruth proposed to the final king who can bring you into God's garden where there is plenty. We did a study on Ruth a few weeks back on Wednesday night at our church, and he was asking me, what I took away from this and he was going to ask me the following Sunday but he never did but this is what I took and I actually came straight home and wrote this down and I and I commented on his on the video they posted from the teaching and hopefully he saw it but this is what I took away from this teaching from this book where it speaks of we can bring our need to the one who can buy us back we are bought at a price and it also makes me think of the story of Hosea buying back his wife. The story of Hosea is showing God's love for the backslider. Even when our faith is weak, God is always faithful. Do not look at the storm, but be still and know that he is God. He's in control and always provides and is faithful to forgive and bless us even when we are faithless. Grace, as was Naomi. She had faith. Eventually. <laughs> Partly why the daughter-in-laws may have been crying. Because her faithlessness is why she left to go to Moab. And why she left to go back. Though we read through the curses, if you live outside of where God told them to reside, the curses that would come was evident for Naomi and Ruth. Even though they were among Gentiles with the pagan gods and out of worship, God used Ruth and Boaz as well to show Naomi that God had not left her. And her faith turned... And when she regained her faith, God richly blessed her, and she was given a child through Boaz and Ruth to carry on her family line. Hence, King David, and eventually Jesus. The lineage is based on the mother. Hence why Jesus is a Jew, as Mary was a Jew. It is not based on the lineage of the father, according to Orthodox Jews. And this is how they can trace Jesus' lineage back to David. And this is how it all started with Eve who left God's garden just like uh, Naomi left her king the kingdom and went to a barren one that God filled it and provided her with a king a rich groom that could 
fulfill her family tree. And so the lineage, the line that needed to be completed for the birth of Jesus Christ to be Jewish and from the mother's side, which is Mary, was completed. This is what I took from the study of Ruth. This is the book that they read on Shavuot. And you can see how important it is. Now, granted, Orthodox Jews do not believe Jesus is the Messiah yet. They will. One day they will cry, Baruch Habab Hashem Adonai. Sadly, at that time, two-thirds of them will already have been slaughtered by the Antichrist. Right now they're doing a, a fasting and praying. They started on May 7th up until Sunday. Um, for the Jews that do not know Jesus as their Messiah, even if you haven't started from there, but you know, if you just keep them in your prayers, they're under constant attack big time. And, and if you're studying end times like I do, you know what's going on in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Um, and they, you know, it's just everything that's happening is 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 told was foretold in the bible thousands of years ago it was written in the bible thousands of years ago and it's coming to fruition now so if you don't know jesus as your personal lord and savior if you have not called out to him and asked him to forgive you if you've been hearing that little voice calling you but you've just ignored it don't let satan lie to you and tell you that you have plenty of time because you don't time is almost up right now it's easy it's the beauty of simplicity you just find a quiet place wherever you can and just ask him to forgive you and to to repent and confess that you are a sinner because we're all as filthy rags we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of god god knew we couldn't keep the law that's why he became flesh that's why he sent his only son that's why he became man so that he himself his son God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit he could die in our place so that the mankind through Jesus would die the sinner's death even though Jesus was sinless he paid the price for us so that we wouldn't have to and if we believe that he is the only begotten Son of God and that he lived a sinless life and he died and rose again we are saved and I just implore you to call out to Jesus today. Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Know that Jesus loves you and so do I.